on the following Tuesday. And uh, we're going to do Qu Quizlet live today after we um, do the notes. How many of you have you've done Quizlet live? Oh, except for, okay. So you guys have an idea. All right, so we ended on National Parks on Tuesday. And just to review and recap what we started with, um, I'm trying to get rid of my candy because I need so much of it. So if you can name the four uh, main federal agencies that oversee land in the United States. Oh, Sandy, yeah. The Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Forest Service. Yes. So make sure you have an idea of the four uh, main federal agencies. Uh, National Park Service. National Park Service. So we said the Bureau of Land Management oversees na uh, national resource land. We said the Fish and Wildlife Services oversees wildlife refuges. Um, we said the U.S. Forest Service will oversee and manage our uh, national forests, and then we said that the uh, National Park Service will oversee our national parks. Um, we also talked about wilderness areas. What is a wilderness area and who oversees it for a piece of candy? Yeah, Alex. Yeah, and who oversees it? Food and Drug Administration? Uh, yeah. All four agencies. All four agencies. So we said that all four agencies oversee it um, because it depends on the, where the wilderness is found. So if there's a wilderness area found inside a national park, I told you 42% of uh, wilderness areas are found in national parks, then the National Park Service will oversee it. If it's found in a national forest, the U.S. Forest Service will oversee it. So it just depends on where it's located. Um, you should know that the wilderness area is meant for the wild. It has the word wild in it. It is not for humans. Humans may be passerbyers or go through it. You may hike in the wilderness, but no permanent settlement in a wilderness area. So no roads, no buildings. Um, it's really meant for the organism and um, for the wild. All right, national parks. So you should know the national parks, as we just stated, is overseen by the National Park Service. Um, the National Park Service was established in 1916. What was our first national park and what year for a piece of candy? Yeah, Alex. 1872, perfect. So Yellowstone National Park was the first national park ever in the whole world. It was established in 1872. Um, we're going to look at another slide and see that other countries followed suit, meaning that they also established national parks. There are 59 national parks in the United States, and there are over 1,200 national parks worldwide. The purpose of a national park, and many of you have been to national parks, is for recreation and preservation. So it's different than a wilderness area because the wilderness is not for humans, it's for the wild, but national parks are. So when you go through a national park, you may see an area that says designated wilderness um, inside the national park. The closest national park to us um, is down here at the Everglades. Maybe you've been there. You know, when you go into a national park, you pay an entrance fee, and the purpose of the entrance fee is to fund and maintain the national park. Um, a lot of critics say that there's not enough funding, and much of that money that, that comes to maintaining these national parks comes from taxpayers' dollars. Um, not only does the National Park um, Service oversee national parks, but they also oversee national monuments. And this is showing you Alcatraz. Has anyone been to Alcatraz before? So this is a federal prison. Maybe you did a tour there. You took San Francisco. You took the ferry. Um, and it was a major prison in the 1950s, 1960s with Al Capone. He was famous for um, being at Alcatraz. And a lot of people like try to escape. They like teach, they teach you about it. And like I guess the water's really cold and murky, and people would try to escape from the prison. And it's, like, I don't think anybody made it to land. Um, here are some of the national parks around the world, just some pictures of Cambodia, Canada, India, and Wales, just some examples. Um, so like I said, many other countries decided that they were also going to establish national parks after seeing the success of the United States. Um, you need to know the first national park. If you didn't know that, you need to know it. Jot it down, Yellowstone National Park, um, 1872. Um, it is found in Wyoming, Montana. and. Um, and uh, Idaho, so mostly in Wyoming right here. And um, it was overseen by the federal government initially versus by the state because they weren't states yet. They were only territories at the time. So 
the federal government oversaw Yellowstone. And then here's a list of some of the po uh, most popular national parks um, in the United States. Uh, maybe you've been to some of these. The top three are still correct, even though your book is old. But the other ones are kind of mixed around. So I have Yellowstone here, 19, or 1852. Just, like, just to give you an idea, maybe you've been to some of these national parks. The most visited is the Great Smoky Mountain, and then followed by the Great Canyon, Yosemite, and then some of the other national parks. I would love to go to Zion. Has anyone been to Zion? It's supposed to be beautiful. Okay. So threats to national parks. What do you think are some problems associated with national parks? So obviously it's land that's set aside and humans can go there. So what do you think humans kind of do or what are some of the problems in a national park? Yeah, bro. Littering. So littering is a great example. Um, people who go in the national parks, maybe they're carrying water bottles, whatever it is, they're not, they're not enough trash cans, and they just throw like stuff on the floor, so littering is a major issue with picking up all that garbage. What else? What else do people do in national parks? What? Okay, maybe there's hunting, but hunting's allowed. Like, you're allowed in some national parks to hunt, to, to, to like swim, to fish, you're allowed to, it's like for recreation. Um, but think about it. if you've ever been to a national park, have you ever seen like any vandalism? When I say vandalism, what do you think of? Of like you think graffiti, but like I'll, maybe there's graffiti in national park. But what else could be vandalism? Okay, fine, I'll tell you. So um, here we have a tree, and you can see that people have kind of etched their names in the side of a tree. So maybe you've seen something like that before. And that's an example of vandalism. There could be crime in national parks. Traffic jams and pollution, yeah. <laughs> yep, people starting fires. So, um, because of the pollution. So, really, your book lists traffic jams, but we're going to relate it to it. Yeah. So the thought is that in a national park, we're like, oh, this place is pristine and clean. I'm sure it's perfect. But pollution knows no boundaries. Like, it doesn't, like, it's not like, ooh, air, all this air pollution is going to stop right around the national park. You're going to walk in. It's going to be perfect. Like, all the pollution will go into the national park. So if you have, like, major roads and highways around a national park, all that pollution will make its way into the national park. So it's showing you, like, this is from your textbook, the daily grind of people who are going to work every day and look there at a traffic jam and all the air pollution, and then the getaway for the weekend, they're all in the same traffic jam with the same air pollution going to the national park. Um, and then just pollution in general, the soil, water, and air, kind of redundant. And resource violations. If you go to a national park, you are not permitted to pick flowers and take stuff home with you. You're not supposed to do that. It's like, oh, look at that pretty flower. I'm just going to put it in my little hiking bag or my backpack and bring it home with me. You're not allowed to do that. So all of these are threats, and you could probably think of even more, but these are just some of the threats to our national parks. And so um, I'm going to show you a picture of my husband. He... Uh, um, I don't, this is, you're not supposed to do this, so I told him I was going to turn him in, and he was going to go to jail. And this is at, um, at Your Wood, which is a national monument in San Francisco. But you're not supposed to do this. So you have, like, trees and, like, branches and stuff. Can you see this, like, thing right here? It looks like a little gate in the background. There's one in the foreground that you can't see it, and you hop over it, but you're not allowed to do. And he started climbing, and I told him that I was going to take a picture and turn him in, and then I was going to leave him in jail. No, no, I didn't. I was on the other side. You can't see. Um, and I told him I'm going to leave him there. And then I'm going to go on The Bachelor or marry some people. All right, so for our national parks, um, a management system called natural regulation occurs. So this is like a management policy for our national parks, and it was established in 1968. It's a management policy which was established in 1968. 
and it's um, called natural regulation. And the idea behind this uh, management policy is that we will allow nature to take its course in national parks. So that's what it says here as its definition, letting nature take its course. And what that means for a national park is that um, if there is a fire that naturally starts on its own, we do not put the fire out. We let it burn. If we have um, fluctuation in animal populations, I think your book gives you an example of the elk population. Um, biologists have watched the elk population increase, and we kind of talked about this with the gray wolf, if you remember. But the elk population increased, and then it decreases and increases due to predators and prey, as well as climate change. We do not intervene. We do not breed in captivity and add more back um, to the area. We let the populations fluctuate naturally. Naturally, We let fires um, burn naturally. So that's the idea behind natural regulation. It's letting nature take its course in a national park. So like I just said, fires are not controlled. If for some reason a fire becomes out of hand and it burns beyond the national park and threatens buildings and people, then we will put it out. Um, and we don't cull animals or kill or remove animals unless humans have introduced it and it's invasive. So we're not going to like mess with the population of animals in a national park. So that's natural regulation. Let nature take its course in a national park. Super simple. Wildlife refuges. So these are areas that are set aside for usually specific animals. And you can see the picture of the Florida panther. And so a great example of a wildlife refuge that maybe you've seen when you've been driving or maybe you've visited is the Florida panther wildlife refuge, which is in southwest Florida, right around here in that blue dot you can see on the map down here. So if you take um, whatever, alligator alley, across the state, you'll see signs for the Florida Panther Wildlife Refuge. Um, you should know, and we already said this, but make sure you know that it's overseen by the Fish and Wildlife Service, so the FWS is in charge of managing the wildlife refuges. And many times it's um, land that's set aside to save an animal. So that's why it's related to the Fish and Wildlife Service, because we said that they're also in charge of um, listing and delisting endangered species. So we have um, our wildlife refuges. I've also mentioned and talked thoroughly about the Loxahatchee Wildlife Refuge, which you should go to. It's a very close refuge to here. So it's so awesome that living here in Florida, we have access to national parks and wildlife refuges. Oh, sorry. And so it says too that the land is managed for conservation of fish, wildlife, and plants. And you are allowed to go there, so recreation is permitted. Um, depending on where it is, you can fish, you can hunt. And you can do a whole bunch of things as long as you're not interfering with the animal that it's saving. So for the Florida Panther Wildlife Refuge, you're allowed to go there in certain areas as long as you're not going to like hurt the numbers of the Florida Panther. So small area that you're allowed to kind of hike through. Has it even, anyone been to the Florida Panther Wildlife Refuge? I've seen a video of it. Um, if you go there, they say not to expect to see a panther. They're very elusive and nocturnal, so like you don't end up seeing them. But you do see other animals. So it's in like a swampy area. You tend to see alligators, different types of waterfowl. Uh-uh, which one? Mm -mm. Is on social media? I'll look it up. Remind me at the end. Um, just some interesting facts about the Florida panther. It is um, the only cougar that lives east of the Mississippi River. Uh, in the 
1970s, the, the panthers' numbers were down to 20 in the wild, so they were critically endangered. Then we have the Florida Panther Wildlife Refuge set aside. They were listed on the Endangered Species Act. And today it's believed that there are about 100 in the wild, so still not a lot. Their habitat is 5% of its original range, meaning that of where it not, like used to live historically, it's 5% of the whole total area. So very small um, habitat left, so due to loss of habitat. And other than loss of habitat, the Florida panther is also endangered because of cars. So we have loss of habitat as our number one reason, but um, in the past couple of years, one of the main reasons is that they're hit by cars along the road. So this top left picture is super sad. You can see a Florida panther that must have run across the road, and so it was hit by a car. Um, you can see, oh, look at this, look how cute it is. It's a baby, it's a little spot. This picture down here in the bottom right-hand corner is showing you the fences. So if you drive along Alligator Alley, you can see the fences. They're meant to prevent the animals from kind of like running into the road. But the fences aren't always made to so well. And obviously we have our hockey team. For our wildlife refuges, I mentioned this the other day, but um, we have at least one wildlife refuge in every single state. So every single state is going to have a wildlife refuge. The first one was established in 1903 by Teddy Roosevelt. And it was located off the coast of Jacksonville. So it's right here, right where my little red dot is. And that's Pelican Island. And so that was the first wildlife refuge ever established. Yep, 1903. And you can kind of see here in Florida the ones that we have close by. Uh, so here is the Loxahatchee Wildlife Refuge. Like I said, that's behind Bedner, super close to us. Florida Panther Wildlife Refuge. Uh, Pelican Island. Yeah, I just shot it down. Pelican Island. Uh, if you look down here, uh, if you ever drive to the Keys, there's a crocodile wildlife refuge. Um, I, if you ever go to the Keys, you'll see it. It says Crocodile Crossing. It's really cool. So it's for the American crocodile, which is obviously different than the alligator. Um, you can't go there, though. No, I tried to go there and it's not open to the public. All right, so moving on to forests. So we're going to talk about forests and forest management. What are some benefits of having trees and forests? So switching it up to forests, we're going to move into national forests. Oxygen. So some of the ecosystem services provided is that it's going to give us oxygen and also take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Other than just oxygen and carbon dioxide, what else does it do for us? Okay, it helps to block wind. So we said like mangroves along coastlines help to buffer wind because they're tall and they absorb that wind speed. So it reduces the wind speed on, on um, land. Yeah. Reduces erosion. This was one of the answers to one of the questions I think on your exam. Um, so because the roots of the trees are going to hold the soil in place, it helps to reduce erosion. What else? Look at this picture. Yeah. Yeah, it provides us with food, with medicine. And then up here in the, in the picture here, you see they have some um, wood here, so building materials. So forests are really, really important to us. It occupies a quarter of Earth's total land. Can you name some biomes that um, include trees and forests? Pretty easy. Many of them have the name or the word forest in it. Matt, what's an example? of a biome that can, includes trees, any type of forest. Okay, chaparral like has small shrubs. Rainforest, there's a forest. What's another one? Tropical, uh, tropical rainforest, boreal forest, also known as the taiga. What's another one where the leaves fall off the trees annually? Temperate deciduous forests. So we'll also talk about tropical dry forests. So we um, have forests throughout the world, and as it just says, occupies a quarter of our surface. Um, of all of our forests, where do we get most of our lumber from? It covers 11% of Earth's surface, this forest. Boreal forest. Good job. Um, so supplies materials to us. 
like food, such as nuts, fruits, as well as medicine. Here's a willow tree where we get salicylic acid from. Do you guys see face wash that has salicylic acid? If you ever look at the face wash, read the ingredients. Do you guys read the ingredients in your stuff? Read it. If it says salicylic acid, we end up getting that from many different types of trees, like willow trees. Um, provides us with ecosystem services that you guys just listed a whole bunch. It helps to control the climate. Again, it takes carbon out of the atmosphere, and we know that carbon is the number one anthropogenic greenhouse gas. And also helps to reduce erosion. So these are just some of the important characteristics or things that we get from forests. So this is part of the hydrologic cycle. If the trees are removed, then that water many times runs off or goes down into the groundwater, or if we have cement or roads, it runs off into sewers. So trees help to aid in the hydrologic cycle, increasing precipitation in an area. All right, so forest management. Um, traditionally, we have tried to manage our forests for the, all the products that we need, so lumber, in order to make or use in construction. And traditionally, we've had monocultures. What's a monoculture? I think mono means one. So what do you think a monoculture is? Super simple. One culture or one type of tree. And so traditionally, we've had forests. They're called forests, but they're really tree farms, where we have one type of tree in order to get the lumber from that tree. And this is not good for the environment for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you have one type of tree, you can think you're going to have an increased susceptibility to pests. So if there's a type of pest that's going to, um, I don't know, eat the leaves of a tree, then it can spread through all of the trees. And same with disease. So it, um, with monocultures, we have an increased possibility of widespread disease and pests. It's also not good for the soil. Because of that, we have to use heavy applications of pesticides. And in our pesticide chapter, we'll talk about the, the negative um, problems with pesticides. But we don't want to be drinking pesticides, or we don't want it in our grounds or in our water. And because you have one type of tree, it's going to attract very few organisms. You're going to have low biodiversity in an area. And here's a picture of a monoculture. For sustainable forestry, this is environmentally friendly. We're going to have something called polyculture. So if we're trying to grow tree farms or trees on a farm, we want to have different types of trees so we can reduce the amount of pesticides that we're using. We're going to have different ages of trees. If we have one age and we cut them all at the same time, that's going to increase erosion. And we also want to use habitat corridors. So if you look at the bottom right-hand picture, it's giving you an example of a habitat corridor. 
And going back to chapter 17, we said a habitat corridor is like a link between two biomes or two areas where animals can go from one place to another. So we have in the picture in the bottom right, we have some trees and a forest in the background. You can't really see the foreground, but trees and forest in the foreground. And we have this kind of like corridor or like link here where animals can kind of go through the forest along the waterway and go from one patch of forest to another. So they don't have to go out into the open fields here for this tactical. Different types and different ages. And then this will be our last second. So four ways of harvesting trees. So once we have our trees or our forest, we need to get that lumber or timber for the products that we just talked about. And the first way is called selective cutting. And we're going to go through all four ways. And we're going to contrast them. At selective cutting, as it says, is when a timber or lumber company is going to go into a forest and they are going to cut the mature trees and leave everything else behind. So mature trees are selectively cut from time to time. Of the four, this is the best for the environment. So we are, I'm going to present it to you from the best for the environment to basically the worst. So this out of the four is the best for the environment. It's best for the soil because you're leaving a lot of the trees behind, so we don't have a lot of erosion. You're leaving the trees to increase biodiversity. So because we have many trees that are left behind, we have animals that are gonna live in the tree. But the problem is that a lumber company would not want to use this technique because they're not gonna make a lot of money from it. So if you're only removing just a few of the large trees in a forest, you're not getting a lot of lumber. So most timber companies do not use this way of um, tree harvesting. And I'm going to stop.